Hey, it's Bucky here. I'm really glad that you chose to listen to this episode because it's a really fun one. You will laugh and learn a lot about a couple of different cultures and about Brooke and me and how the culture of living in one place or growing up all around the world has affected us personally and how it has affected our ministries. So I hope you stick around and listen to this one. I do want to give you a disclaimer about the audio quality, and I'm going to go ahead and throw Adobe Podcast Studio under the bus. So far, it's been a really great tool for capturing our audio in a higher quality across the distance, but this time it kind of failed us, and I have salvaged what I could from the files, but hopefully it doesn't annoy you too much. All right, with that said, on to the episode. Well, welcome back to another exciting episode of the International Commission podcast. I'm Bucky Elliott, and this is Brooke Stewart. Say hello. Hey, hello. How's it going? Now, on this podcast, we tell stories from the mission field. We talk about how to share the gospel with people from different worldviews and backgrounds and different religions. We talk about funny stuff, talk about cultures and travel, and all sorts of things in we between. We talk about a lot of funny stuff. And so today, tell the people what we're going to talk about. People, today we will start off with a cool culture segment because we haven't done that in a long time. And then we're going to be talking about the pros and cons of living in one place our whole lives or moving around a lot all around the world. Since Bucky and I have pretty different backgrounds, and so this will be fun to, to hear the pros and cons. Of both. And so that's what we'll be hitting on today. Cool culture. Okay, for this segment of cool culture, Bucky and I have chosen countries for each other to find fun facts about and report them. Bucky has chosen Saudi Arabia for me, and I chose Laos for him. And so we're going to give whatever facts we'd like to about these countries so that you all can learn how cool these places are, or how weird they might be, or different, or odd. I personally found a lot of weird laws, because I love looking up weird laws about places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of the path that I took. Okay. Interested to see the path that you took. I also found some things on the religion as well. And so, would you like to go first, or would you like me to go first? Uh, I bet yours is going to be really interesting, so I'll go first, and we'll save the okay. best <laughs> I don't know. I just, mine are interesting. Just I, the weird laws thing uh, tells me that that one's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. They're interesting. And I mean, it, I won't give away too much, but it, it definitely makes sense in the place that Saudi Arabia is. And so that's okay. a little hint beforehand. Why did you choose Laos? Because I couldn't figure out where to choose, honestly, and I wanted to choose a place that I didn't know much of and that I figured you didn't know much about. Mm -hmm. um, I had a friend go there for a while, and so, and there's, you know, there's very rural areas of Laos, and then, so, you know, I was just curious, was, you know, let's learn about Laos. Why not? I had a friend that served with YWAM in Laos, and so I know, like, a little bit, but re honestly, not not much. So I had to yeah. look these all up. And nice. so a couple of them I recognized like, oh yeah, I knew that about the place, but I'm by no means an expert. So this was fun. Nice. A fun well, little research Why did project. you choose Saudi Arabia for me? I chose Saudi Arabia because I've just been fascinated in recent years by the Arab world. Okay. And that is one of the places that I would really love to go. And well, that's all I'm allowed to say about that. <laughs> yes. But let yes. the reader understand yeah. International Commission has a partnership, international partnership in Middle East somewhere yeah. coming up. Yes, we do. All right. Laos. Laos is known as the land of a million elephants. They're my favorite uh, animal. That sounds great. And. Let's be honest, Asian elephants are the best. Really? African elephants are cool, mm -hmm. all right? But I just feel like, I don't know, Asian elephants are so sweet. They are. I have met an, an Asian elephant when I was in Thailand, and it was really sweet. It hugged me, 
and I loved it. I also love how quiet elephants are. They can walk behind you and you can't hear them. They're so quiet for being so ginormous. Because they're it's so wild. huge. You're like, oh, tromp, you know, tromp through the through the jungle or whatever. Like you think yeah, you can no. hear them, or even in the desert, you'd hear them like the the pounding yeah. on the ground. They're so they're quiet. It's amazing. It was one of the greatest days, honestly, the day that I got to meet an elephant, got to feed it. It was so cute. Uh, but I do have to say this about African elephants. Their ears are shaped like Africa. That's cool. I know. It is really cool. It's called the land of the million, million elephants just because they lots. live there, of yeah. course. And throughout history, uh, there, I guess, were millions of elephants there. I mean, their population has declined. But there are a lot of conservation projects okay. uh, for elephants there in Laos. And so, hence the nickname. Pretty cool. I think it's cool. Uh, Laos is about 60% Buddhist. That okay. is the uh, predominant religion. And even though maybe 60% of people identify as Buddhist, it permeates the culture. It's very influential in, in oh. everything about their their land and culture. So that's very important to understand Buddhism if you're going to go there and, and visit or especially uh, work for the kingdom because you should just know the worldview of the people mm -hmm. and what's important to them and how to communicate with them. Uh, there are identified 126 people groups wow. in Laos and 60 of those are unreached. So that's 76% of people groups and about 5.8 million people that need the gospel. Wow. So there's definitely work to be done there. Uh, the good news is there are many Christians there that we can work with. Uh, but it's only about 2.5% evangelical okay. in the country. So that's not, uh, on the grand scale, that's not a whole lot of people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's 2.5%. Uh, it's got to work with the... Uh, with the 5.8 million people to befriend and reach them with the gospel and make disciples. So that's the work we've got cut out for us as believers in <laughs> Laos. Culturally, Laos is heavily influenced by French colonization and the Vietnam War. Okay. So two very different things that happened, but uh, it was a French colony. And so a lot of that influence is still there in their architecture, language, cuisine. And so you have this, this sort of fusion of cultures. And I've experienced this in the Philippines, but that was a Spanish colony. But you can see how the colonization has left imprints in their language and in their culture and foods and some customs and things like that. So it's really interesting because you might notice that if you spend time there. So you yeah. look at the buildings, you eat the food, you uh, listen to the people speak and just see Maybe some of the holidays or customs they have, styles and art, are influenced by the French there. But also the Vietnam War was very impactful to Laos in unfortunate ways because they were basically used as slaves to supply the uh, Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese army. And the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail uh, runs through Laos. So mm. basically that means that many, it was a supply route. And so that means that many, many Laotian people were pretty much, you know, enslaved and forced, forced to transport things for the army, forced to grow uh, and give things to the army. And so that had a really negative impact, of course, on their economy and morale and all of that. So that with bombings and other warfare really, you know, did a lot of damage to the people there. So that's, that's a sad thing, yeah. but that's something to understand as well is that this is, this is a recent part of their history. And so this is something that especially the older generations are going to remember and be impacted by and probably have traumas from and memories from and the, the poverty that has, that it's left behind and impacts everybody. However, Laos is a land of natural beauty. Uh, this is in uh, Southeast Asia. So think of, uh, you know, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, that area of the world. And so you have jungles and mountains, just really? stunning landscapes. 
yeah. I've not been, but I've seen plenty of pictures and footage from it and talked to people that have been there. And it just sounds like it is really, really amazing place to be. Yeah. However, the humidity and bugs. Wow. Uh, you know, tourism is picking up in Southeast Asia, but it is the, the climate can be pretty challenging for yeah. people like me. But I'd love <laughs> to go I'll go anywhere. Uh, foods. You got to talk about foods when you talk about a culture, as far as I'm concerned. I and didn't so, actually think about that at all. Uh, I know, man. Well, in Laos, there are lots of spicy foods. Um, if you're familiar with Asian food, come Southeast Asian food. Uh, it's it's very similar. It, it can it has all the components of uh, rice, sticky rice, uh, noodles, pork, well, other meats, but a lot of a lot of pork chili peppers and other veggies, you know, potatoes and onions and all kinds of stuff mixed into stews or other dishes, but lots of spice. That sounds good. I've not had a lot of Laotian food myself, but I have had uh, some kind of spring rolls. I don't know the name. Of them, <laughs> but they make some really, really good like spring rolls. And I think it's kind of one of their claims to fame. I really like ancient history and archaeology. So Laos also sounds like a cool place to go because there are several UNESCO World Heritage Sites there. And uh, that would be pretty cool to uh, explore those. Yeah, I found a list of them. I, I don't know what any of them are, though, so I feel kind of ignorant. There's Luang Prabang, Wat Phu, and the Plain of Jars. At bonus points if you know what any of those are. But... I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love to find out. I want to know. <laughs> Another unique feature of Laos is the bamboo bridges. Ooh. I bet you find them in rural areas. Now, I'm sure they're really scary. Like think, Probably. you know, Indiana Jones, Pirates of the Caribbean. That's what uh, I thought of, yeah. The, yeah. And I would, I would do it with a lot of prayer, but I would be terrified. I, I'm very uncomfortable with heights, but I like to challenge that fear. Uh-huh. It's a huge rush. Uh, so I would, I think I would do it. Wow. Okay. The other thing is, is I just, things that native people build, I trust them a lot of times, even if, if they look kind of <laughs> rickety and because like, I figure they've had millennia to figure out the best way to do this. So like in the, in the Philippines, I've been on things like that, little, you know, footpaths and bridges that were made of all bamboo and they seem pretty solid, pretty narrow, but pretty solid. Yeah. And uh, in that vein, there's lots of other bamboo architecture there. And the same throughout Southeast Asia. I know a lot in Cambodia. There's a lot of homes built of bamboo uh, and boats and lots of other things. So it's, it's popular building material because it's available, of course. Mm-hmm. But also because traditionally, they have just passed down all of these techniques of how to use it in a bunch of different ways. Right. So you'll see houses and temples and other structures, scaffolding. I think all throughout Asia, you see bamboo scaffolding used to build mm-hmm. uh, more uh, modern buildings as well. So that's pretty cool. Uh, what questions do you have? And if I don't know the answer, I'll either make it up or I'll guess or I'll say I don't know. Did you find anything specifically about like rural Laos versus... That probably is a really good question. I think my assumption would be that a lot of it is rural, just Mm -hmm. smaller, smaller towns, because just the terrain makes it difficult to build large cities. Yeah. So y'all should Google that because I don't know, but I'm guessing that (laughs) it's probably hard to build really large cities. Someone find out and tell us. (laughs) Yeah. Nice. Would you rather go to Laos or Saudi Arabia? (sighs) Well, of course I want to go to both, but uh, I would say Saudi Arabia just because I've been in Asia a lot. Mm -hmm. I love to be there, but I feel like Saudi Arabia would be something unique. It's interesting, I which I didn't mean to do this, uh, and I don't think you did either, but Saudi and Laos both seem to be places that, I mean, according to what you've said, are just now starting to become more touristy areas. Yeah. So that's yeah. really interesting that they're both that way because Saudi for the longest time was very, very closed off, which I learned. Um, and they're just now opening it up to tourists coming and seeing them. Tell place. us all about it. <laughs> Is that all you have on Laos? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So first, as you were chatting a little bit, I looked up the most popular foods in La- uh, Saudi Arabia so that I can okay. join, join the fun there. And the first one, I don't know if you saw <laughs> my, I had an open mouth for a second. I gasped for a second because <laughs> I came across this. It says camel burgers. No. Camel burgers made from camel meat. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the meat from the hump is considered to be the most delicious, but all the meat is quite lean, rich in protein, and contains less cholesterol than other red meats. The taste is comparable to beef, which is with a slightly sweeter aftertaste. So that there you go. There's so camel burger. I'm interested. Okay. All right. I don't know how interested I am, but I'm, I uh, can't say I ever had any plans to eat a camel, but. That's what I they didn't do. either. I'm surprised that they do though, because they're you know work animals. Yeah, but I guess there's a lot of them. I mean, yeah, we went maybe. to Jordan, and whenever we went to Petra, there was just an abundance of there were a lot of them. That's true. Dromedaries. Dromedaries. But to be precise. To be precise, this one sounds interesting to me. It's jalab. It's a fruit syrup drink made from dates, grenadine syrup, carob. Raisin, great molasses, and rose water, known for its soothing flavor. Uh, in order to enhance its aroma, it's often further smoked with Arabic incense and sprinkled with raisins, pine nuts, and crushed ice. So that looks pretty tasty, honestly. Looks like a I'm nice try raspberry looking tea, but it's not. But a lot of them, yeah, chicken and rice, you know, lots of varieties of spices and flavors. This one looks good. It's termed Ka'ak, it's broadly used for the variety of biscuits or baked items in Saudi Arabia, but the most common form is a hard, dry, ringed-shaped biscuit. It can be baked with sesame seeds and fermented with chickpeas. So, and it looks just like it. It kind of reminds me of the braided donut, you know? So yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. The twisted I donut. Like uh, in Tajikistan, that's a Persian culture, but they it's it's a, a another Muslim culture too that there's a, this particular kind of bread that sounds kind of similar to that. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't always have any kind of a, a seasoning or seed on it, but it's like a round, crispy crust and really soft on the inside. And they It's very ornamented. They braid it mm. and shape it different ways and stamp it and stuff like that. That's cool. I think that... Breads of the world, man, I'm telling you. The breads of the world are amazing. They're so cool. Yeah. So much cooler than here, mostly. <laughs> we don't really put much art into our bread. No, some people do, but it's not common. We do make challah sometimes. Oh. That's a Jewish bread that they yeah. eat on Sabbath. Yep. That's So cool. you break that, and it's it's kind of fancy. I guess it's the closest thing that, that I do. I make non bread. Oh, and man. And it's really good. I, I've made you make it. non bread because you eat gluten free. Non bread. N O N. No, it's in A A N, as my father called it a few years ago, nan bread. Like, no, it's all not. the dad jokes for you guys for free. Those are <laughs> non bread. Okay, so shawarma classic. I mean, you can expect oh, that yes, in most places. Um, this one sounds interesting. Mutab- mutabak. It's a spicy folded omelet stuffed with ground vegetables and meat. The ingredients vary from region to region, but most common is beaten eggs, chives, minced meat, and green onions. It's thought to have originated in Yemen, but it's now famous oh. across many Arab countries and even throughout Southeast Asia. So, and it looks really yummy. So there's a lot, um, a lot of, yeah, chicken and rice and things like that, but delicious looking chicken and rice. This last one sounds interesting, Amba. It's a fermented mango condiment made from firm, unripe mango spices and peppers placed in a jar. A salty brine is poured over the ingredients and the jar is sealed and set aside to ferment for over a week. Once it's fermented sufficiently, the amba is pureed to the desired level of thickness. It has a spicy fermented sl- sour flavor. I have a feeling I might not like that. It's not sounding great to me. No, it sounds you know. interesting. There's other things that look really, really delicious. Katayef is a kind of sweet dumpling. Stuffed with cream or nuts, typically a mixture of hazelnuts, walnuts, almonds, pistachios, and raisins. Yum. I'm here. I'm here for that one. Yeah. Other ingredients include unsalted cheese, powdered sugar, vanilla extract, and cinnamon. 
And it's in a, a pretty ring, and there's dates around it. It looks so good. Anyways, yeah, okay, well, I go to Saudi just for the food, honestly. Yeah. Okay. But back to what I originally learned. So weird laws. I think weird laws are so much fun. If you've never looked up weird laws in your state, you should do it. Yeah, you probably have some pretty strange ones, and you're probably breaking them, and you don't even know. You don't even know. I found out in Oklahoma, where I live, it's illegal to take a bite of someone else's hamburger. (laughs) Amen. You know what? (laughs) I I don't know who wrote that law, but I like that person. Unless I'm eating someone else's hamburger, then yeah. I, I would be okay with eating someone else's. But I yeah, people break that one all the time. You know, you let someone else try your hamburger. Well, in the so. world did that come about? There had to be a good reason, you know. Yeah. That's there had to be there's another one. It's illegal to go whaling in Oklahoma. <laughs> we are in a landlocked state. There are no whales here. <laughs> so wow. yeah. Anyways, those you know, those don't really make sense. There's there's gotta be a good reason. The ones from Saudi Arabia, though. There's got a story behind that one because there's got to yeah. be a really good one. There has to be a good reason why it's illegal to go whaling and to eat someone else's hamburger. I'm really curious on that one. And someone must have just ruined it for everybody, you know? it's Exactly. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't support the eating of other person's hamburgers. Not not without consent. Permission. Anyway. Express permission, yeah. 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 So... Here's some weird laws in Saudi, and these kind of make sense because of the culture and religion, and so you'll kind of be able to see that. So no Valentine's Day. They do not celebrate Valentine's Day. It says, as countries across the globe celebrate Valentine's Day, I think even other Arab cultures, uh, it becomes, it's very different in Saudi Arabia. It's not an Islamic tradition, and it's considered to be an event that would lead people to date or have contact outside of marriage. To combat this, individuals and businesses are forbidden to highlight Valentine's Day in any way. The Committee for the Promotion of Virtue and Prevention of Vice, a.k.a. the Religious Police, keep an eye out for any store selling red or heart-shaped items and even red roses. (laughs) And it says oh. youngsters aren't exempt either, and schoolgirls are sent home to change if there's even a, a slither of red on their person, if they're wearing any red at all. And in nearby Dubai, Valentine's Day is celebrated in a big way, but Saudi wants no part of this decadent symbol of Western culture. I'm not shocked at first blush by, you know, an avoidance of Valentine's Day because it's, you know, a Western thing. And right. It's, rooted in Catholic tradition and stuff. But a, a prohibition against it is, does, does seem kind of strange. It's a little extreme, honestly. But yeah. yeah, so no Valentine's Day. Don't even wear red. None of that. Don't think about heart-shaped anything. Just forget it. So another law, no public music. You'd think that you know, really? you can you can listen to music. It's not played. It's not allowed in schools. And by extension, there's no schools that will teach music. Even stores and malls don't play music through speakers to avoid offending re- religious traditionalists who see music as a pathway to moral destruction. This is so even in the country's music industry is thriving, even though the medium is not legal. So they have a lot of singers and everything, but there's not concerts there's not any cinema they don't have theaters and things like that it's really interesting that but no public they're rocking it on spotify or something yeah exactly they can and i mean they can listen in their homes and i I guess at weddings probably too but yeah in the public public. yeah not okay but that is interesting this other law this one is not surprising but it's interesting so women cannot work out at a gym. Saudi women who want to work out can't even be seen in girls only universities in their gyms or anything like that. So if you are a woman in Saudi Arabia and you want to work out, you have to do it at home, which I I personally don't enjoy. Maybe the treadmill industry is booming there. If you're looking to invest in something, we gave you guys a great idea. And Peloton... (laughs) We'd like to thank our sponsor. Hell, they're not. <laughs> they're not sponsoring us. They don't know who we are. Um, this is another interesting one. When when a woman of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia turns forty five, 
she's finally allowed to travel alone. She cannot travel before she's 45 alone. She has to have the physical or electronic sign permission of a male guardian to travel with her or father or husband with her. So I thought that was interesting. Um, this is another, this is not surprising. If you go to Thailand and a lot of other countries that have monarchies, you're not allowed to badmouth the royal family. Mm-hmm. You're also yeah. not allowed to question Islam. So there's no questioning. You can't talk bad about them. That was before we went to Thailand on a trip. They said, you know, do not speak against their king and queen, any of their royal family. Don't say anything really about them at all. You know, just don't talk mm-hmm. about them. Uh, and so you have to be very careful. Lots of regulations on social media. Uh, you're not allowed to take photos of random snapshots of people on the streets, which, you know, is common in some places. Oh, you're also prohibited from taking selfies with cats. You can't do that. <laughs> well, forget so. that. Scrap any plans <laughs> I to go there. Yeah, uh, don't take any serial cat selfie or and wow. Okay. Yeah. I could take random photos of just the cats maybe if I or other people are not in the frame. Yeah, probably. I'm going to, that's going to be my defense if I get the opportunity. Or you could have someone that is traveling with you do sneaky pictures of you walking past a cat. So, you you know, it's the cat in the picture. So, yeah, it says a prominent cleric, uh, Fazan El Alpha, Faz one, anyway, I don't know, made a television appearance during which he prohibited people from taking selfies with cats. He believes the technology contributes to loose morals and leads people away from Islam. Those cats, cats? man. Yeah, I guess so. It's not <laughs> unique for someone to posit that cats are evil, but that seems like... Uh, if you're in a more like a... Oh witchcrafty sort of place and you prohibited black cat pictures i mean sure. i guess i could understand yeah but just if there's cats? yeah if there's some cultural reason where they're you know where cats are are associated with the occult or something it's illegal to dab there's even a picture of a, a guy dabbing and there's an x on it it says a poster of a saudi interiors ministry national commission for combating drugs says that dabbing was banned warning people about the dangers of this on the youth and society. So dabbing it's a gateway is dabbing's a gateway drug, everyone. <laughs> it is a gateway just drug. No. <laughs> I think the title of this is gonna be just say no to dabbing. <laughs> I love it. Go ahead and call it right now. Uh you all may have heard of this before, but PDA, public displays of affection, are very they're very looked down upon. Even with your spouse, you cannot even hold hands or anything. The maximum fine for PDA is around 800 US dollars. So do not hold hands. Don't hug. No kisses. Don't even act like you like your spouse, honestly. If you're I, I've <laughs> heard that that is the case uh, in some Arab countries. I, I didn't notice that as much uh, in Jordan but I guess it was like there's certain areas of town where it's kind of more, more traditional and conservative and others where it's more kind of cosmopolitan and Western influenced. And I didn't really notice people uh, avoiding each other, but uh, I understand the rationale behind that one. Yeah. It's a hard one, especially being, you know, with my husband, we hold hands most places where we go. That would be something I would really have to think about not doing the last one it's illegal to hold two passports in saudi arabia uh second passports will be confiscated by the immigration authorities if they're discovered that was from business and insider there's a few other destinationtips.com if you're wondering where i got this information so yeah you can also find it just google it yeah so maybe they are um concerned about people having aliases i don't know (laughs) Is there, a, to be is there an espionage problem there? I don't, I don't know, know, honestly. I'm not sure. But here's some religious and historical insights. So 92% of Saudi Arabia is Islam. Of the 45 people groups, 29 are considered to be unreached from the Joshua Project. So that's quite a lot. 
And in 2015, this was interesting, about 56% of the kingdom's Muslims were under the age of 30. So it's a very young seeming country. There's there are a lot of young people there. Uh, Saudi is also home to two of Islam's holiest cities. So if you're wanting to learn about Islam, you need to know about Mecca. So Mecca is here. This is where the Prophet Muhammad was born, and Medina is where he is buried. Every year during the Hajj, so this is one of the five pillars of Islam. If you, we had a a podcast. I don't remember which one it was, but we talked a lot about Islam. In so Hajj is the pilgrimage that people have to take once in their lives if they can afford it, and they go to Mecca. And millions of Muslims from around the world travel here. Uh, it's a six day pilgrimage to the Kaaba shrine. And so that one have a little bit more on that. I did recently learn that mosque, that shrine itself uh, is exclusive to Muslims. Mm -hmm. But I think the whole city of Medina is off limits to non-Muslims. Yeah. I think, I think it's both actually. Yeah. It's both. You cannot go there. If you are non-Muslim, you will be kicked out deport i don't know but they do not want non-muslims there it's interesting that there are i mean we live in a technology age but we have a lot of pictures and videos of the kaaba mm -hmm. and it, which yeah. you don't know if you don't know what the kaaba is in mecca it's this ginormous huge black cube <laughs> in the city and every year during the the pilgrimage they will walk around it just thousands of muslims will just walk, people, yeah. walk around it and i think they you know they can touch it and put their sins upon it or something um but the kaaba is built around a sacred black stone a meteorite that muslims yeah. believe was placed there by abraham and ishmael it's a symbol of god's covenant with abraham and ishmael and by extension the muslim community itself mecca is thought to be the place where ishmael and his mother hagar were provided with a spring of water in a desert it's a very sacred place, the most sacred place in in Islamic community. And some uh, people say it's the most sacred religious site in the world, just because it's revered yeah. and protected so much. Wow! I don't know how you measure that kind of thing, but I don't. It makes sense if that's the explanation yeah. that just because it is so protected, right? You reserved just for Muslims. It's a the most holy site in the world. Yeah, and that's pro probably why they were so closed off for so long, Saudi Arabia, uh, well, yeah, I mean, to, because just protect the whole country to kind yeah. of protect that place. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. There's also a lot of other historical, I think probably uh, Christian or, you know, biblical sites in Saudi Arabia that, you know, were kind of protected as well, possibly. They also, it's just a very conservative place. I think that they just didn't want Westerners or anyone to come no. there for a long time. No, and, they, so and it sounds like from these laws, they're, they've, tried really hard to uh, keep out Western or Christian influence. Yeah, it is a very, very rich country, though, very rich. And um, so the Saudi Arabian government, you might know this, Bucky, is follows an ultra conservative called Wahhabi interpretation of the Quran. So Wahhabism uh. began as a social and religious reform movement in the 18th century and is closely associated with the founding and consolidation of the Saudi kingdom. Wahhabism calls for the literal interpretation of the Quran and includes strict enforcement of religious codes and practices. For decades, the Wahhabi doctrine has been upheld by clerics who run the judiciary system and the, the religious police. I mean, you can already tell from the religious police and the different rules that they have and laws that they are pretty conservative. I think that they're starting to become a little bit less conservative based on what I found. Um, it's a relatively young country. You know, they have, it's a kingdom, which the king who is pretty young, I think he wants it to be a little less conservative and is trying yeah, to. Yeah, I know that the, the crown prince has made a lot of social changes in the last just few years. Yeah. I think 2019, they opened up a tourist visa. Or it might have just been specific to Americans to have a tourist visa, mm -hmm. uh, but their tourism industry is is new, like you said, yeah. and uh, this crown prince mm -hmm. really has relaxed mm -hmm. a lot of at least a lot of the enforcement of some of those laws against uh, Western influence. Yeah. I think the laws are probably still still exist, but he has tried to implement a relaxation of the laws at least on foreigners. So I'm pretty sure. I mean, I would guess that if you 
are Saudi and you are Muslim, then you abide by all, all the, these laws still. But because they want not to be not to become westernized, but because they want to be friendly to the West and participate in the global economy more and more, they are allowing a, a lot of people in. And so in the major cities, kind of like it was in, in Jordan, in the major cities, you'll see a lot more kind of relaxed and casual uh, social interaction and commerce yeah. and entertainment and art and stuff, yeah. Yeah. Um, restaurants, yeah. and you see people wearing more uh, Western clothing and whatnot. Although you need to, to cover up. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you wear, you know, long pants, long, long sleeves, uh, and women stop to dress very conservatively and modestly. Yeah. Uh, what you should do if you're going to a place like this, just to be respectful. Yeah. But it's very important to them. And that's still uh, law or, or very seriously uh, taken customs. Yeah. Um, so what I've learned about Saudi Arabia is uh, from some like YouTube videos, travel vloggers uh, that I've watched that have been there. Mm -hmm. And so what you were saying about uh, taking the photos and videos in public, that's been relaxed too, just in the last couple okay. of years, because they have allowed and they kind of want vloggers to come in and show the world what Saudi Arabia has to offer mm, interesting. to attract more tourism. So that's really interesting, but they still, it's not a universally accepted thing. Mm -hmm. And so while you're kind of allowed to film where you have permission from the local people, like I don't mm -hmm. think there's like a film permit or anything, but you just kind of ask people that are around you, hey, do you mind if I take some pictures or video? They say yes, and you're kind of free to free to do it. But it's still frowned upon to to take images of people without their permission. Or have some social awareness, you know? Yeah. <laughs> some awareness read the room folks yeah read the room if someone is completely covered they probably don't want pictures taken okay. of them. Don't want you to take yeah. so it's interesting say. i guess the only way really to know how it is is to you know go and find out or yeah. go go and you know, watch some youtube videos and and learn from people's experiences who have been there recently yeah but that's the thing is it's it's all new all of that is new all those developments are new and the crown prince wants to welcome more people from around the world there yeah so if you you are not muslim they can't expect you to be and of course you don't want to compromise like if you're a christian you're not going to compromise to the point of adopting uh muslim uh customs that contradict your christian beliefs but when it comes to modesty that's just not really a thing yeah right you know and so you can go along with that and be respectful but there, there's just kind of this balance between just trying to be as respectful as you can of their society mm -hmm. uh, but coming as a visitor and sharing your own culture and then of course if you have the opportunity to uh, build a friendship with someone and they're open to hearing about the gospel and you share the gospel um, what i'm hearing is that is allowed now as well uh That's, wow you know going out and preaching on the street corner is probably a no-go yeah probably but not. if you're in someone's home or in a cafe and they strike up a conversation and they ask you because they're aware of christianity they know it's a thing yeah they don't know the gospel uh, mo i mean by the vast majority but uh, you you may have opportunities there and so the religious persecution has changed mm -hmm. as well where if you are Muslim and, and you convert to Christianity, uh, that is seen as you know a crime against an action against Islam. And you probably will be in trouble for that. But yeah. someone who is not Islamic, mm -hmm. who is talking about another faith, they're, they're becoming more okay with that, apparently. Wow. Um, so if you are um, proselytizing, course that's that's an action against islam right and they see it so you'll probably get kicked out but you probably won't go to jail so that's just an interesting thing in any that case is. you're going to a creative access place or a highly unreached place our rmo as international commission and our advice would be don't just go and do that on your own uh, go and go and work with someone who is mm -hmm. a believer and knows how to navigate that and how in their own culture to be 
harmless as serpents. <laughs> that is definitely <laughs> harmless as a garter snake, as wise as a python or something. I don't know. So, anyway, that, you and get don't it, so. don't dab if you're going. So don't. That's right. How to be respectful in Saudi Arabia. Do not dab. Keep your, if, keep if your you're, music to yourself. Don't dab. Don't take pictures of random strangers. If you get anything from that, take that away. <laughs> yeah. All right. Shall we go to the next segment? Let's. And we music can break. play music because music. we live in we America. Play, we will play music and you can play this loudly and proudly uh, out in public so everyone can hear our little segment music and our podcast in general. Yes. Learn something. Also, Caleb, my husband, agreed that the little voiceovers do sound like Vision. Some of them do. So yeah, from if Marvel. you've noticed that some of the some of the little transition uh, bites sound like Vision. Learn something. Believe that if you'd like. It could be. It could be. Bedroom. Maybe we gave him a call. Maybe he listens to our podcast. Hey, maybe so. The Avengers <laughs> listen to our podcast. No big deal. It's fine. Yeah, no big deal. It's, <laughs> it's okay. Okay, so we're talking pros and cons of growing up in one place or around the world. So I grew up in one place pretty much my entire life. Weird. I lived in one state my entire life. But Bucky Strange. grew up moving all around the world. So That's right. I It's hard for me to identify with that. Um, uh, well, first let me say, uh, I, I suggested this segment, this topic for the segment, and the reason is, uh, I was inspired. Oh. My inspo cred is Third Culture Podcast. Oh, nice. Uh, there's many podcasts called The Third Culture Podcast or Third Culture Podcast or Third Culture Kids and stuff like that. But this is the one with uh, Faith and Krista. Okay. And Thanks, they Faith are... And huh? I said thanks, Faith and Krista. Thanks, Faith and Krista. Hopefully you listen to this. Probably have no idea. <laughs> but I think we should have them on because we could all talk about some really interesting things. They are both uh, third culture kids who've grown up in the Philippines and Middle East and Asia and other places. Of course, Asia because they'll be in Canada and, and now they live in California. And But they talk about how being a third culture kid and growing up in many different places has impacted their, their life, their personalities, and ministry. Mm -hmm. And so I just think that's a, an interesting angle. So I wanted to talk about that from my own experience of how yeah. has growing up in many different places and adopting different little pe pieces of different cultures. I feel like that has prepared me really well for cross-cultural ministry, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, having coworkers and Brooke is one of them who grew up in one place that also have some of those perspectives. I think that's really interesting. So I want to kind of talk about that and yeah. How do you gain a global awareness uh, living in one place? Now, my suspicion is it has a lot to do with just if you have a global mindset from the gospel. If you have a missional perspective in your life and you're motivated by the Great Commission, well, then I would, you know, that, that would lead you into wanting to go to the ends of the earth. So, but let's talk about that. Like, what, what are... What do we see as pros and cons of growing up just in one place and having an actual hometown, yeah. which I understand here in the U.S. Uh, or in Brazil, where many of our other followers are, that might be your experience for, for mm -hmm. most of the people listening to this. But for me, uh, it is not. And I, I actually cannot imagine having just one like hometown where everybody remembers me and all the crazy things I've done. And, uh, <laughs> and going back there all the time and like just having roots in one place, yeah. uh, because I am a third culture kid, mm -hmm. which basically means uh, a third culture kid is a person that grew up in a culture separate from the one their parents grew up in. And it's called a third culture because really uh, when you interact with other people that have lived that same life, you kind of adopt your own unique culture that is not attached to a really a place. Yeah. It's kind of a blend. And people who have grown up as missionary kids, as diplomats, kids, 
as military kids, which I'm an army brat, have kind of our own separate third culture, mm-hmm. not attached to the place. And it can be really varied based on where you've been and where you've lived and things like that. But there are a lot of things in common uh, that develop in just kind of your worldview and personality and habits and sorts of things. So uh, I think Third Culture Podcast is really interesting. They talk about those sorts of things, but really the focus is how it pertains to ministry and living life as a believer. So I think that's cool. But I'm an army brat. I was born in Germany, lived there for several years. I've also lived in England and around the United States, I think seven different states in the U.S. Wow. And so even moving around one country, like in the U.S., you can just take on lots of different cultural yeah. uh, you know, things. And So yeah. what would you say are some pros of growing up? In, in a one place, small one town, a small town girl living in a lonely world. Yeah. So I kind of had a different, I've had different thoughts on growing up in one place my whole life. And it's interesting. My husband has even grown up in lots of different places. So he and I have different experiences as well. But I lived in a small town prior to Oklahoma. It's not that small. I mean, it was around 9,000 It's pretty people. small. Bro. It's pretty small. I mean, okay, there's other small towns in Oklahoma. My husband lived in a place there was only a few hundred people in the town. And so it, it's, it was small, though, comparatively. Well, listen, when you drive places. through it, uh, it looks really <laughs> small because you just see, like, the main street. And you yeah, can't you see, see, like, what stretches behind it on either side. It looks yeah, really small. Yeah, it is. Okay, it is a small town. But, you know, growing up in a small town, it was fun because we, you know, you'd go to football games on Friday nights. You'd have everyone did kind of the same thing. We all had kind of our purpose. You know, we're going to go to the football game on Friday night, knowing your teachers, knowing people. You know, never have to start over and find new friends. Now, mm-hmm. listen to what I say. A lot of the pros are also cons. I mean, there can be a lot of pros and cons to the same things. And so, Again, you also know your teachers. Your teachers know you. They could hear bad stories about you or they could hear good stories yeah. about you. Um, and another con, you know, you don't have to start over constantly and find new friends, but then you also don't really get the opportunity sometimes to, to make new friends because you feel kind of trapped in, in one group, you know. So that's kind of just more for younger areas and generations, but... A major pro, I loved this. I love it now even more. Growing up in one house, it's so familiar. It's homey. It's comfortable and welcoming. I love visiting my parents because they still live there. I grew up in the same house for around 20 years. (laughs) And I lived, the first four years of my life, we lived in the smaller house on 15th Street. And then whenever I was four years old, we moved across a main street to another house on 15th street. How dramatic. <laughs> and we yeah. Just take a so, wagon train all the way over there and <laughs> have to uh, ford the river. And yeah, it was across, actually it was called, across Elliott street. Fun fact. And so, lady. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I grew up in the same house for around 20 years and my parents still live there. And so it feels very homey. It has the same smell, you know, the same feel and it's just very comforting Uh, And so kind of going on to ministry, it was easier raising support because everyone in the same, everyone was kind of in the same town. So I kind of had a a general location of where I knew I was going to be raising support from. I didn't have to travel to lots of different places and states. I've known of people who've lived in different states for throughout their life and they had to raise support that way by traveling to lots of different states to meet people that they knew. And so that's, that was a hard thing. Um, but you know, a lot of people knew me my whole life. And, uh, so they, some people saw who I was and, you know, saw how the Lord was working in me. Uh, but that was also a con It is everyone knows the young you and will think of you that way your entire life. <laughs> Little Brookie. Little Brookie. Yep. Yeah. So I was very shy and timid whenever I was young and that's how people thought of me as I was growing up. And it, and I was like, I've changed. I'm not the same person I used to be, but that's how people view you. And True. so you don't really have the opportunity to kind of try new things necessarily. Cause it, you know, so 
kind of going. Everyone will say it's a phase. It's a phase. Yeah. And so I wanted to actually move a lot whenever I was young. I wanted to move to a new house. I would, I wanted to move to a new city sometimes because I was bored living in the same small town. It's easy to feel trapped in where you are, you know, just in this small town. Yeah. Yeah, In the small town, uh, mindsets, you know, you have people around you who just, you know, they're content with never leaving their town at all. <laughs> and, and you I, can't listen to music and you can't take pictures and you can't dab. <laughs> There's actually a little too much dabbing in my hometown, honestly. But <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's just, and I especially realized I didn't have a lot of cultural awareness or exposure whenever I was young. Because we lived in a primarily white town. There's lots of Native Americans. I'm Native, but I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't really connect as well with that part of my heritage and culture. There's some Hispanics, but that was all. You know, there was not a lot of cultural diversity. There's starting to become some more, but whenever I was young, there was not cultural diversity. And so I did not know really anything about other cultures. I kind of didn't like that. And I mean, now I live in a bigger city, but uh, I live in Oklahoma City. But, you know, whenever I was young, I just didn't have any thought to really other cultures much at all, you know. And so I think that that was a con to to living in the same place. But I mean, you also, uh, you can get really comfortable with where you are, which is kind of a bad thing sometimes. But some other good things, my parents were teachers in the same place most of my life. So we had the same schedule and we were together all the time. They didn't change jobs. You know, they didn't have to worry about that. And so that major impacted me, majorly impacted me in a really good way as just me and my family were together all the time. And it was really great. I got to have, they, their influence was the influence that I had, you know? And so that was really good. And traditions were easy and fun to keep. So this is kind of just more on the secular side or, you know, Christmas, Thanksgiving, we had expectations of what it was going to look like. We were near family. And so there was a, a big pro to, to living in the same place and having family nearby. And I think that that would be really hard, you know, growing up in different places all the time, is you don't get to see family as yeah. much. You're around your, your family and that's it. But moving back into cons of living in the same place and starting to get into the missional world, I felt very intimidated by third culture kids and missionary kids because I, and I had a, one of my best friends, she grew up in Southeast Asia and moved around a lot. And she was a third culture kid, a missionary kid. And just looking at her family, I thought that they were so much cooler than me. They, were, they knew so much more about culture. They knew so much more about life. And I felt so intimidated by them. And just, you know, going into missions, getting into that world, I thought, how, why would God want to use me? I'm from a small town and I know nothing about culture. They grew up thriving in different cultures, learning about it. And my friend encouraged me. She said, you know, I was exposed and kind of made to be in missions. I was forced into it. You know, it was something ingrained in me. But she said, you know, God just called you and showed you you know, what he wanted you to do. And you didn't have anyone around you influencing you into that, really. You know, it's just the Lord yeah, leading you I, to that, I, I, which I did have a lot of influence from my family and a lot of support from them. But they didn't travel a lot. They had not had a lot of cultural exposure. They had some, but I I thought that, that was encouraging just as I started, as I started becoming, you know, more involved in missions. It, it became clear that It didn't matter my background. It didn't matter that I had never really lived anywhere else. The Lord wanted to use me because I was some, I was ready to, to listen to him, you know, and that's, that's what it is. It's not, oh, you need to have grown up in all these different cultures and have all this exposure to missions to, to be a missionary minded person. No, that's not true at all. You know, the Lord uses I mean, even looking in scripture, most of those people, they didn't move around a lot. They were in one place and the Lord used them. And so, yeah, you th- I think I'm, I'm thinking about Abraham and I mean, eventually, of course, he moved around a lot. But at first he was he was doing his thing. Yeah. And Ur and traditional sources say that he was probably well, we know the Bible says he was a wealthy man. Mm-hmm. But uh, putting that through the filter of anthropology and other other traditional 
sources. A lot of people understand or surmise that he was a uh, uh, he was a man of business in industry in mm-hmm. Ur, which Ur was is another whole topic. That was a very advanced ancient city, and God just called him out of that to go out into the middle of nowhere. Oh, well. <laughs> yep, yeah, get up and go. So I think that you know, as you if you stop looking around at the other people who are in missions and start looking at scripture, you can see that the Lord uses lots of different people (laughs) in lots of different areas. And, you know, sometimes it's to stay, sometimes it's to go, which the story of the demoniac really encouraged me whenever I was in a place where I really wanted to leave. I wanted to get out of a small town. I wanted to get out of Oklahoma. I was desperate to get out. And the, Whenever the demoniac has been healed, he begged Jesus. He said, please let me go with you. And Jesus said, no, you need to stay and go and tell everybody how the Lord has been good to you, what the Lord has done for you. And that really spoke to me because I was trying to move to California back in 2020. And I read that story. And that was the story that got me to, to stay in Oklahoma. I didn't stay in prior. I moved to Oklahoma City. Um, but it was, it was, it was what got me to stay just realizing, okay, this is, wow, that's you want cool. me to stay and I tell of what you've done just in, in Oklahoma, you know? And so, which I've been able to travel on short-term trips since then, but it's cool how the Lord will speak to us through his word. And he knows exactly who I am. He knows how I grew up and it didn't matter. <laughs> you know, he, he, he led me. Is it hard for you to learn and adapt to another culture? I mean, if, if, you know, when you hear, when you hear you speak and talk about other cultures, I mean, someone could assume that you just have had a lot of experience traveling and, and adapting to other cultures and stuff because you know how to appreciate and respect them. But to me, that, Honestly, that surprises me from somebody who who did grow up in one place. How you know how how has the Lord given you that kind of appreciation and the ability to to do that? Yeah, it, it's from the Lord, honestly. Uh, and I think I had a lot of influence from my parents. They were very loving, very open to other cultures, and they learned that from their parents as well. And I mean, they had really hard lives growing up. <laughs> but something that they learned was to, you know, that the Lord made every culture and everything. And so, and I had just a lot of influence from my parents and loving people, loving cool. the different nations. And But still going to a place that's so dramatically different from the Midwest United States. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, it's gotta be hard to do. It, it honestly, I, it can be sometimes, but I, uh, I've always been someone, I don't want to go and change other people's culture. I want to go and I, I, I want to be the person that doesn't stand out as that weird, dumb American that doesn't know anything about culture. And so it could be personality. It also just could be the Lord helping me to, to see and love different cultures. And so I don't necessarily know where it comes from other than just it's the Lord that has helped me whenever I go to other cultures to try and even in learning language, I, I learned Spanish in college, you know, wanting to, to sound like the the locals mm-hmm. because I want learn, to blend learn in. Learn the accent in their yeah. vernacular. Yeah. yeah. And so it's something that's just, you know, I, I don't want to come and be that person that's so different in culture. And so I think it's partially just maybe wanting to just fit in with a culture, but also having an appreciation and love that American culture is not – the center of the world. It is not the only right culture. It is not the only wrong culture, you know? And so just having more of a social and cultural awareness, I think is really good to learn. And it takes, it can take a while to learn how to have that. Uh, But I think that the Lord can build that within people. Sometimes I see people and they still, they don't have a cultural awareness at all. They still think American culture is the best culture I do think it's a good place to grow up. This is not, uh, God did not describe or prescribe American culture in the Bible. It is a culture. Yes. (laughs) And it is a really, as a, as a country, it's a really good place to live. It is. I'm telling you, it is, 
We, we have a lot of blessings here that uh, and opportunities, which I think we should steward for the kingdom even more than we do. Mm-hmm. That's a soapbox that I'm not going to get on right now. But I think it is important to recognize uh, everything that we have and all the advantages that we have. Yeah. And to appreciate them and be grateful for them, but mostly to to invest those uh, in the kingdom. But I think that I think that travel is such a good way to do that yes. and to really to kind of force that appreciation upon yourself because you really don't know how good we do have it right without experiencing the other side, you know, or really most of the world. Yeah. Because that's the reality is our culture is not only just it's not the best culture in the world by default. And by the way, we've got a lot of problems. There, there, are, oh, some, yeah. there are some good reasons uh, for some of the, some of the conservative policies that a place like Saudi Arabia has mm-hmm. to distance themselves from immorality. Yeah. I don't know that government restriction is the way to do that, but they're, they're aware of some things in our culture that are not God honoring. Yeah. That, we're just not aware of so There's things like that and yeah. just the infrastructure that we have um you you got to go somewhere else really to appreciate you do cool. and that's what i think that we can be so s- small and simple-minded in america just to have zero cultural awareness for for the world around us and that's what i think it's crazy when we, when people think that american culture is the only culture and people need to adapt to the american culture they don't uh, yeah, that's that's not it's just, to all, say the, it's just the, all that they know, and and that's, I mean, I don't really want to excuse it, but but it is an explanation. It is, you know, when someone thinks, "Hey, this is the this is the standard mm-hmm. for how the world should be," and that's how I was like, that's, that's, you know. yeah, that's what I thought. I mean, maybe it was subconscious, but I thought whenever I would see different ways of living, it it was just very, it felt very foreign and you know, why, why isn't this way? But the Lord helped me in that. And it's still very hard whenever I see other cultures in how they respond to family, how they respond to shame to, it's something that I do not understand. I can't understand, you know, and just looking at it. And sometimes I do think that it's wrong. And, you know, and sometimes it is because it's coming from a place of the flesh and from sin. Uh, But I mean, other cultures will see Americans and, think why do they act this way that's absolutely horrible and I'm like you know that's just kind of how it is but I look at other cultures sometimes and have the same mindset of how could you possibly act this way how could you think this way I don't understand it and you know I look at American culture I think it's very loving and very you know towards family and everything and other cultures and like is there any love in this culture but you know things are just expressed differently uh and you know I think that we can we, we can't truly put our minds into other cultures if we, have, if we are not that culture, if that is not what has been ingrained into us. And so that's why I'm interested in hearing your perspective as a third culture kid because, you know, you're surrounded by people who have different ways of thinking. And so that's kind of an influence in you. But your parents who grew up in America have their influence of – Definitely. the American mindset and, you know, the guilt, innocence yes. mindset. And so, yeah, I'm really interested. Tell me the pros and cons. So that is definitely true. And I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up because uh, something that I want people to understand is that, uh, so I did grow up uh, between Europe and the United States and uh, I loved experiencing different cultures and traditions. And I've always been interested in missionaries. I've always thought uh, in, in mission work, I've always thought that missionaries were really fascinating and I love to learn about their experiences and learn about other cultures. And just, even though we, I, I grew up in Western society, even being overseas uh, in, in Europe, I was interested in other cultures beyond that as well. I just didn't understand much about them. And I've learned a lot of that as an adult. So we kind of have that in common that a lot of things that I've learned about like the global South and East, I've learned as an adult, but I was exposed to people from every part of the world Mm -hmm. while I was growing up. But it, and I always loved to learn. I wanted to learn about their food. I wanted to learn about their language, their customs. I love holiday, different holiday traditions. I love learning about different holiday traditions. And I'll, I'll go ahead on, on a little rabbit trail here and say that's one of my pros is that I feel like I've had the opportunity to 
kind of mold my own family traditions, picking and choosing things from different cultures that That's I think like are cool. meaningful mm-hmm. or just fun. Yeah. And there are a lot of parts of, there are a lot of uh, more, more American traditions, like when it comes to Christmas or Easter things that I've kind of gotten rid of, or I've just kind of like, I don't care about. You don't because celebrate I just, Christmas like, or Easter anymore. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I said. No, I uh, there. There's a lot of traditions, very very American traditions around, like mm-hmm. you know, Christmas or Easter, that I just don't care for. Or I just yeah. I don't think they're very meaningful, or I think they're off focus, and so I just don't really care about those. So anyway, yeah. it's this being able to learn and adopt things from different cultures that I think are meaningful. I've, I love that. I love that that's been a part of my life. Uh, all that to say, uh, I grew up mostly on army posts or other military bases. Maybe they were a, a British Royal Air Force base or something like that. But even being around people from lots of other cultures and taking on a lot of the local culture through education, through just exposure, uh, traveling around, becoming friends with people from different cultures, Uh, I've learned a lot of that stuff, but it was all kind of in this context of go America, you know, where the, where the, we're here because they need us because they, they want us and uh, we're, we're important in the world. And uh, this is, yeah, it was very, very America first. Look, uh, I grew up very, very patriotic and I don't think that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I just think it's a bad thing if it's taken to an extreme to, to like an idolatrous extreme. Uh, or just a, a an extreme where you're blind to uh, the rest of the world. But it's funny because my experience might be a little different from a missionary kid or a diplomat's kid because we lived in in the military culture and it is very very uh, America centric. Right, right. So I do I did also grow up with that a lot of that perspective. And mm-hmm. part of it was also because my parents are both from Tennessee. Uh, if I do have a home base, it is uh, the Nashville area. Yeah. It's just, that's where we did, when we did have the opportunity to go home for Christmas or during the summer, uh, we would go to Tennessee. And so that's kind of the, the place I identify with here in the States. And that was their culture. Uh, my, my mother is from the Appalachian culture in Eastern Tennessee. My dad is from uh, middle Tennessee. And so I, I did grow up with a lot of American Southern values and customs, traditions, beliefs, and things like that. Yeah. That I got from my parents because that was the household I grew up in. Mm -hmm. But I know just like your parents, mine were very open to the world and Mm -hmm. very mindful of the rest of the world that God made and the other cultures that God created and other peoples that God created. And so every opportunity we had, we did learn about them. So, for instance, when we lived in Europe, every opportunity we got, we would go, we would drive somewhere else to some other country. We would camp. That's how we got around Europe a lot, driving and camping and just on purpose, taking in the local history and culture and trying to learn. And I really value that. Yeah. And so one pro is, I think, growing up that in that way, whether you were a military brat or otherwise, if, if your family was intent on learning about the world, it just made me very appreciative, very curious Mm -hmm. and very adaptable. So I've counted that as a strength. Yeah. And I've just kind of always understood that, known that, regarded that as kind of a superpower Mm -hmm. that I get from being a third culture kid is that, you know, initially nothing's off the table if it doesn't violate my morals. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll try any food. I'll, I'll learn about any custom. I didn't, I just, I, I grew up with the mentality that when I'm a guest in another place, like you were explaining that the Lord has put on your heart, I want to adapt as much as I can and be respectful of their ways yeah. and cult, their ways and values. Uh, because one, I just don't want to be disrespectful. Mm-hmm. Really, I want to just be respectful and I want to build bridges for the gospel. Right. Now as an adult, that's my motivation. But also, I don't want to give Americans a bad reputation. Yes. At least <laughs> I don't want to perpetuate the reputation that, that we might have in some countries. Yes. 
and that was really baked into me as an army dad because mm-hmm. everywhere we went, we understood that we represented the United States mm-hmm. and we represented the army. Yeah. Even as civilian children, our family represents America. And that was very important mm-hmm. for us to represent the U.S. well. So I think that was just a great thing to be yeah. kind of programmed into me as right. a kid. And I, and I now when I travel, I have that mindset. And now I'm more thinking of I want to represent Christ well. Mm-hmm. That's the main thing. But I do. I, I do still want to represent Americans well. Right. And sometimes people will comment, oh, you, you know, you're so adaptable or you, you seem so comfortable here. Like you seem mm-hmm. uh, to, to go along with things so well. Uh, and many Americans aren't. And right. so I can tell, well, it's because I, I grew up experiencing lots of different um, cultures and economies and things like that. And so I'm just just adaptable. Yeah. And I think that's a blessing. A lot of interpreters also will tell me that I speak very clearly and I'm very easy to understand. <laughs> and unless I'm rambling or talking in chunks or backward like I tend to do because of ADHD, uh, when I'm speaking with a translator or through a translator, uh, I'm very conscious of it. First of mm-hmm. all, I speak very clearly on purpose when I think I need to. And that's a skill I learned growing up as a third culture kid and as yeah. a traveler, because I want to be understood. In that a is place an where excellent I skill to have. If you are going on a mission trip, side note, speak clearly for the sake speak of everybody. <laughs> everybody can put in a little extra effort to speak clearly to enunciate Mm -hmm. to slow down to not use a bunch of slang and jargon because international people probably are gonna have a hard time understanding you yeah but i just grew up with it as a (laughs) as a standard thing it's just it became part of who i am because i've talked to so many people throughout my life that didn't speak english as a first language and i want to be understood well Mm mm-hmm and it's just kind of a respect thing. Now, when I'm really tired, I will slip into some other kind of accent and it can be different. And I can't explain that to you. That is a weird quirk of third culture kids <laughs> that we have different accents that are just as natural to speak in. Right. Yeah. That and we're sense. not putting it on and we're not acting and we're not. It's just we can switch. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people call it like code switching. That That's usually more we're talking about, you know, slang or, or a, a dialect, but it just, mm-hmm. it just comes very naturally. And I don't even really think about it. Like if yeah. I'm in the, if I'm around very rural country people, whether that's in Tennessee or even in Texas, I noticed this when we went to Granbury and Glen Rose, Texas, by the end of the week, I was so country. <laughs> and I just, you adapt. Some, I adapt. Yes. Yeah, so I adapt just to what's going on and the way to dress and the way to eat and the way to just to, you know, survive the day, Yeah. whether you know, transportation or sleep or food or whatever, but also with the language or accent. Yeah. It could be just a, a subconscious safety mode for you because you moved around so much. It's like, I have to fit in, you know, I need to be a part of this culture. So, so. That that's it. Uh, one of the episodes of Third Culture Podcast that I mentioned earlier that I was listening to while I was I was driving, we we drove actually through Oklahoma yesterday mm-hmm. with my family, was about accents. So mm-hmm. that's why I'm stuck on this right now. And that, that's what I'm thinking about is uh, part of the reason for that is that we do want to be understood. But another reason is, just like you said, we've not really had a place to belong. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean this to sound like really sad, but yeah. we want to be accepted and to belong wherever yeah. we are. Yeah. And so subconsciously swapping our mannerisms, our customs, our even, you know, some habits and definitely the way that we speak. That's mm-hmm. very common for third culture kids uh, yeah. to be able to do that and to do it subconsciously. Yeah. Maybe the risk of that is that people might think that you're trying to mock them or trying too hard. Yeah. Some people don't like when you quote unquote, you know, code switch to their Mm -hmm. accent or slang when you're not part of that culture, Mm -hmm. they think it's appropriation, but the reality is it's just a subconscious Mm -hmm. process that that's happening. And I don't, I'm not even aware of it for a while, Mm -hmm. but it's really a a genuine thing. And it's, it's automatic. Really. I think third culture 
kids and just third culture people in general are are just very interesting because I grew up knowing some, a girl from, that she grew up in Kenya. And so completely different culture. And you could just tell whenever she, she came, she would wear clothes that didn't match. And, you know, but there, and there are things that, you know, Americans would just, the other kids would be, you know, very weirded out by her just because she was so different. She was coming from African culture, growing up in African culture, moved here when she was very young. Uh, but it is interesting just learning about third culture kids and interesting that they're called third culture kids because they truly are their own culture. Yeah, and it is a combination of culture. And it's interesting just seeing how, how they do adapt, how, you know, it is hard to feel a part of one specific culture. How do you identify with one culture whenever you've been surrounded by so many other cultures? And so that can kind of, I don't know, has it ever given you any sort of identity crisis or anything yes. like that? And I'm glad, I'm glad you asked. Cause that's what I'm thinking about now is yeah, actually one big con is that even though I I'm, I'm good at observing mm-hmm. and adapting to customs. The other side of that coin is like you said, part of that is cause like I have to kind of strive to belong somewhere. Right. Maybe, maybe my brain is always operating in that mode to, Hey, don't be too weird. Hey, <laughs> uh, try try to fit in. Uh, and so, yeah, when I've moved around a lot, in contrast to what you said, I have had the opportunity to reinvent myself a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's because I just want to try something else. I want to try out a different kind of, you know, style for my clothes or mm-hmm. whatever. Uh, it's maybe I want to try out a different kind of accent. Right. And introduce myself that way in a new place and live that for a couple of years and then move on somewhere else and have the opportunity to, to start over again. Yeah. Or even things that I like or hobbies that I have or interests that I have, maybe I'll get tired of something and just want to try something else out somewhere else. Or of course, if you go somewhere and you're not fitting in and it's hard to make friends and everybody's into something, I can quickly adapt to that interest and I'm more interested in the friendships than the the hobby or the interest or whatever. But I can, I'm a quick study. Mm. I, I can learn just enough about that to kind of make some friends. And uh, and it's not about being fake, but it's just about being being adaptable yeah. and trying to respect what, what people value. Mm-hmm. On the other side of that is I've never really cared about fitting into a clique. I've never really cared about trends, fads. I may have taken them on superficially to not stand out so much initially. But then once I've gotten comfortable with people, I'm just my own person. Yeah. And so I've been able to stick to my Christian convictions. I've been able to just kind of be true to myself even though outwardly how I present myself has changed over time. Does that make any sense? Yeah, for sure. And I think that that's a huge grace of the Lord to, to be able to protect you, especially growing up in very secular type places as well. I mean, you had influence from your parents and the Lord protecting you in that way. But it was a lot of worldly culture around. Now, I will say there, there are a lot of Christian people in the military or at least nominal, but I was surrounded by a lot of, of you know, Christian uh, belief and faith and lots of Christian people. And of course, in my own home, was, my parents are very strong Christians and I grew up with that. And really that started to be challenged when uh, I was thrust into the civilian world, honestly. So even though I was exposed to, you know, other views and other, other beliefs and customs, uh, the military still is pretty kind of rigid and stringent and there's no, there's, it's just not encouraged to kind of explore outside of the, the mm. box yeah. that you're in. And so it wasn't really until I was in middle and high school that I went to a civilian school mm. and was exposed to all sorts of other values and beliefs yeah. and sorts of things like that. That was the first time I really realized, man, there's so much more complexity to American culture than I was aware of. Mm. And so many other 
values that are not Christian and not God honoring that I just didn't really know anything about. Mm-hmm. And so it was kind of weird. But because I had a strong identity as a Christian, I was just able to let things roll off, you know, and I was able to maintain my convictions in high school and be my own person. Wow. So while I've been, maybe there's a better way to explain what I was trying to say earlier. While I'm able to adapt enough to get along with anybody, mm-hmm. which is what I did in high school, I wasn't in any clique and I wasn't interested in being in any clique, but I'd learn enough of other people's interests to be able to talk to them yeah. and kind of get in their circles and have conversations with everybody and try to make friends with everybody because I just, I didn't want to be someone else based on what other people thought was cool. Right. I, my identity really is first as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, mm-hmm. not as an American, not as a Tennessean. I live in Texas now, but as, as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Mm-hmm. And because I know so many people that are strong Christians, stronger than me, that are from other places, that just really drives that home as well. Yeah. That Christianity and, and American culture are not the same thing. In, right being able to objectively look at my own culture and see the weak spots. Yeah. Uh, this, and that's, uh, that's something that I think is really amazing about someone who grows up in a lot of different places is they have as believers. And I learned this from one of my friends who grew up in Asia. She, she just said, you know, I don't have a place to call home. And I think that the Lord maybe made it that way so that I would view heaven as my true home. So I think that that's something that's, and I was going to ask if that was hard, you know, not having some place where you feel like you can call it home because I still, you know, I have the mindset of heaven is my true home. Yeah. And I believe that wholeheartedly, but I still view places as home here on earth because I lived in a place that was my home for so long. I lived 20 years in the same house and I still view that as going home whenever I go there and it still has brokenness in, it, in, in where it is. I think of things that I had gone through, you know, living in that home. You live 20 years in a place, there's going to be lots of brokenness where you see it. But, you know, it's still home in my mind sometimes. And so I think that people who have the third culture mindset or li- grew up in a different country are able to have that heavenly mindset sometimes maybe more easily or just it, it's just natural in them to think this is not my home. That was not my home. That was not my home. Where I live next is not my home. My home is in heaven. And so I think that's a beautiful thing about culture. And I mean, it is a, a joyful thing and a gift whenever the Lord allows us to view a place as comforting and home and, you know, a place on earth that we can view as a very loving and caring place. But I think it's also a gift whenever the Lord moves people around and gives them the mindset of heaven being their true home. And so it's interesting just the the good things and the bad things about yeah. both of our growing up. I think it's a plus that no, no, I've never I've never really had a place that this was it, like this was my home's where I belong. Yeah. Uh, I feel like a visitor everywhere. Mm-hmm. And that sounds kind of depressing and sad. And in some ways it kind of is because I have one con is I've dealt with a lot of loss in my life. Yeah. And sometimes third culture kids will become adults and then start to realize some of the losses that they've never dealt with. Yeah. Because you've lost a lot of friends. Mm-hmm. You've lost a lot of homes. You right. your identity. Like if you're not a Christian, uh, many TCKs really do have a hard time with identity. Yeah. But I, I do see it as a plus. And I didn't always, I'll say that as a kid, I didn't always. Sometimes I did wonder what it was like to just grow up in one place and have one place just sit there. Because like I can make friends quickly mm-hmm. and I can attach to people very quickly. But unfortunately, I can let people go too, which yeah. like is so, like it's awful. And I recognize that that's awful, but it just, I don't know, it's been a part of my life, you know. It's the but adapting, are, I think. Are, yeah. <laughs> But those are real losses. And you, right. sometimes you don't realize that you're grieving friends that you had that were really close uh, because you're just used to moving on. But because of all of that, I really have always just felt like a visitor everywhere. Well, and so just, for me to have the perspective that I'm just a visitor here on earth, I'm just passing through. Mm-hmm. This version of earth is not my home. Yeah. Uh, 
we're looking forward to something, you know, greater and restored and fulfilled and redeemed. And that's really my home. Yeah. And that's, that's really easy for me. It's almost um, the, the joy in loss. Like you're able to kind of identify with really seeing yourself as a visitor. I think that's kind of an amazing and hard thing to come to, you know, because I imagine there's probably other TCKs and MKs who really view that as something that they hate is just, you know, I can't, I don't have anywhere to call home. You know, I have to constantly say goodbye. I remember a missionary, I got really attached to her children just in the week that I saw them. And one of the daughters came up to me and she said, I don't want to forget about you. And it was so hard for me. And I just wanted to cry. And she told me later, she said, do not cry in front of my children. They have had to say goodbye so many times to people. And she told me, you know, a life as a missionary and a life as a TCK is a life full of goodbyes. And that really hit me. That was really hard because I have not experienced having, I mean, going on short-term trips, I kind of, I think I'm able to detach quickly because I know that I'm not staying and you might have that as well. And so, uh, it's easy to, yeah, it's easy to get close to people quickly. And I think having, you know, gone on short-term trips has kind of helped me with that, but uh, it is also, it is really hard for me to say goodbye to things and to places sometimes. I mean, we had had family move and it was extremely hard for me because I was I'm not used to goodbyes, which is interesting because you have that benefit, but it's also a con as well. It, it is, yeah, just, it's, you know, I'm not used to having to say goodbye to things and places that I've grown attached to as much as you have. And the more I'm exposed to it, the harder it feels. It's just, I didn't grow up having to say goodbye to people very often. I grew up with the same people. I grew up doing the same things. I grew up in the same house. And so I didn't have that, which I mean was, it's somewhat of a blessing, but it's also not because I don't know how to do it sometimes. You know, it's hard to, to know how to say goodbye or to, to distance myself from something that I really grew to love. And so Another yeah. weird effect is that on, on, in that kind of in that vein, another weird effect is that I'm not very materialistic yeah. because I just have to lose everything. Not everything. Yeah. I lose my <laughs> stuff, move all the time. Uh, does not get attached to worldly things too much, but I also I'm weirdly sentimental about certain things. Yeah. There are certain things that have been a constant in my life. Like I'm weirdly sentimental about some right. stuff and I want to, some part of me does want to hold on to, people or a place, mm-hmm. you know, but then, uh, you know, they do, those things do eventually kind of fade too. Yeah. But, and it just, it makes it kind of easy to be away from home for a long time, except for missing my family. Right. But like missing home itself. I don't I mean, you know, not that I'm saying take it or leave it, but like, it's just another place. It's where, right. it's where I lay down now, but most of the time, but like, I'm pretty much comfortable anywhere yeah because like i'm a visitor there i'm a visitor here i don't really belong here but i don't know it's just kind of a weird thing yeah one thing that you'll experience if you go on short-term mission trip and you work with other believers is you will feel an instant familial bond with people that Mm -hmm. may surprise you even you might be different cultures (laughs) yeah you might become closer to those people than people that you do know back home, even in your hometown very quickly. Right. And then because there's that, that, that bond of Christ and then you have to leave and yeah. it's, it's hard, it's hard. Mm-hmm. but it's such a beautiful thing too. Yeah. We could talk forever on this. Yeah. There's, it's just, it's so interesting. Some of the commonalities that we have mm-hmm. just because of Christ right. and, and, and our parents instilling values into us, Yeah, but also differences with, uh, just attachment to to place that I, yeah. I just don't really have any concept. Of. Yeah, really, there's definite differences that we see, but it's it's cool. Yeah. To and you're adaptable you. because you want to be, yeah. you know, and I'm just kind of adaptable by nature. Because you had to be. <laughs> I, yeah, and sometimes it worries me that I'm so easily able to just leave this for that. It's like, oh, well. Yeah, it is interesting. Just the what you grew up and had to deal with versus what I grew up and had to deal with and just how the Lord used both of those, you know, so somebody who might've grown up living around the world may have hated it and then decided once they became an adult, I'm going to stay in one place and build roots here. And then for me, it's like, I might've 
I, I grew up and it's like, I wanted to travel. I wanted to leave. I wanted to go to different places, but then, you know, how the Lord has led me was to stay. And so I had to do kind of the opposite of what I wanted to do, but the Lord has really blessed that. And I've been able to find a lot of joy. I got married, you know, having a family and things like that. And so just interesting how the Lord uses so much just for his own glory and to work and to create very unique individuals in the family of God. Amen. So it's also kind of weird that I would, I would live wherever in the world and the Lord does have me here Mm -hmm. in the United States, like in the South, which it's different. Texas is different from Tennessee, but there's a lot of commonalities. It's very similar culture to my parents. And so that's weird to me. Yeah. And that's what Caleb and I, we would both, we would move wherever the Lord wanted us as well. God wants us to be here. Yeah. He wants us here right now. And I was like, well, okay, if this is where you want us, but it's also, I'm okay with being in one spot because I know how to be in one spot too. It and drives so. me crazy. It drives me crazy. <laughs> but here we are. Here we I'm are. I'm learning to bloom. You know, as they say, bloom where you're planted. I'm, I'm here. I think this is the longest I've ever lived in one house. I was going to uh, ask that actually. Where is the longest? It's not the longest I've lived like in a metro area because I lived in Nashville for about 10 years. Okay. Plus a couple of, you know, here and there. I've kind yeah. of occasional uh, stops. Yeah. But... We moved, I think, five times when we lived in Nashville. Wow. So just my wife is a Navy brat as well, by the way. Mm, and we're just both I mean, like that. And yeah, we just can't sit still. So this is because we have kids mostly and just because of the proximity of our home to uh, our office. Because mm-hmm. I get to work at the headquarters. Brooke just has to be like headquarters staff and not here. And that's weird. Yeah. Anyways. I know it is weird. <laughs> but we've lived uh, in this house uh, with our kids for a really long time. And guess what? They all feel like they're from here. That is so weird. Time to move. Got to move. Can't. No, yeah, well, totally <laughs> you move. can't like, feel this way. <laughs> but I wonder what that's going to be like for mm-hmm. them because like, they're going to have a different experience from mine. Yeah. I mean, that's what uh, your parents probably had too. I don't know if, about your parents growing up, but they might have. Yeah. They stayed in one. Yeah. They, my dad moved around Nashville as well. Yeah. Actually. But my mom didn't. Yeah. Just, uh, I think she moved maybe once as a kid. And then for like most of their, you know, not most of their adult life, but when they, yeah. Much like, of their married life, they, yeah. Yeah, they were traveling around. Ah, that's weird. Anyway, okay. Another whole topic. But yeah, okay. We should call it here or else we're going to get Maybe so. I'm going to have to end some of my rambling to uh, keep this under two hours. But anyway. All right. Well, if, hey, uh, if you're <laughs> Anyhow, Bye. If you've lived in one place forever and you're feeling restless and want to go somewhere, hey, look us up. We can help you out. We can help you. <laughs> at least, uh, at least you can go to another state. We can as we and join us on a, a North American partnership, uh, because you might be surprised how much uh, culture difference uh, can exist between different states or even just different cultures within your town. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've worked with, uh, you know, Asian, Romanian, Hispanic churches here in the U.S. Uh, Navajo, many different cultures uh, just here, here in the U.S. So, oh yeah, Brazilians as well, of course, mm-hmm. and, and Florida. Uh, Florida, and uh, get yourself some cultural exposure. It's going to be good for you. Get you're culture. really feeling great. Let's go to a totally other different country. You can go to internationalcommission.org/go. Sign up for one of our teams to go overseas short term. It'll be awesome.